Um, so thanks a lot for inviting me to do this. Um, this is my first time doing one of these, uh, and so I'm sure there will be a couple of hiccups, but it seems like we've uh, got to got to get used to this way of operating. And so uh, thanks to the organizers very much for, for including me. Um, this is joint work with uh, my buddy Sergei Chernenko at Purdue. Um, this project that we've been working on actually for a long time, but uh, we recently uh, recently revised the paper and kind of put it on the front burner. So um, very excited to get uh, get your feedback from from uh, this uh, great audience. So um, the subject of the talk is uh, corporate bond market liquidity, uh, which is obviously um, a very important topic these days. You know, if you've been following the news. Um, the Fed, you know, just one proof of how important bond markets have become is that uh, the Fed has really done some unprecedented things in the last few weeks uh, to help stabilize corporate bond markets. You know, historically, they've been very reluctant uh, to do things that involve credit risk. They mostly just buy treasuries and um, GSE backed uh, mortgage backed securities. But uh, in the last few weeks, they've announced the uh, primary market corporate credit facility and the so-called Main Street lending facilities. And between those facilities, they're going to, you know, they're going to buy lots of investment grade corporate bonds, um, as well as corporate bonds of fallen angels and um, and maybe some high yield ETFs as well. So uh, the Fed intervened pretty dramatically in these markets. Um, and, you know, why did they do that? They did that because the uh, in March, the markets really kind of completely f froze up. There was no trading, there were prices were in free fall, and there were uh, really pretty big concerns that uh, even relatively healthy firms uh, wouldn't be able to uh, kind of refinance uh, maturing, maturing debt. Um, so prior to very recent uh, experience, uh, there have been concerns about corporate bond market liquidity uh, for for several years, you know, ever since the, the I guess we have to say now the 2008-2009 financial crisis, um, people have been pretty concerned about corporate bond market liquidity because really, you know, two things happened post crisis. One is uh, we tried to, at least in the U.S., regulators really tried to push credit intermediation out of banks and into markets under the kind of theory that uh, markets are a little bit more resilient, and two. Um, you know, the so-called Volcker rule uh, made it more difficult for uh, broker dealers to hold inventory and make markets in corporate bonds. And so people have been talking for a while about um, the potential for corporate bond freeze ups and um, a kind of drying up of corporate bond liquidity. Um, one other piece of the puzzle here is that uh, the share of corporate bond uh, held by mutual funds has increased dramatically post-crisis. So this is data from the flow of funds in the U.S., uh, just showing that, you know, um, as of today, about 25% of corporate bonds are held by uh, mutual funds in the U.S. And so that's a little different than the historical market structure. You know, the historical market structure, a lot more of the corporate bond market was held by things like insurance companies and pension funds. Um, and those kind of intermediaries that don't have um, kind of capital calls or, or redemption requests in the way that a mutual fund does. So, you know, as the market structure of corporate bonds has been changing, there's also been uh, this transition where now uh, lots of corporate bonds are held in mutual fund structures that can be forced by redemptions to sell at short notice. And so, uh, and we've seen uh, over the last couple of years, isolated incidents where individual mutual funds like the Third Avenue Fund uh, melted down uh, just because they couldn't actually sell the bonds they held on short notice. So um, what that led to uh, in, in the years between 2009 and today was that, you know, there were practitioners, so mutual fund managers and uh, other kind of bond traders who were really worried about um, the liquidity of the corporate bond market, uh, while um, you know regulators sort of took a different view. They said, "Look at the data." And so this uh, this graph on the right hand side is from um, a New York Fed document um, in 2015, where they just calculated the um, the Amahood measure. So this is the absolute value of return divided by dollar volume in uh, bond markets in the investment grade bond market. 
And they showed that, you know, um, so this measure, when this measure is high, the market's relatively illiquid because trading a dollar moves the price a lot. Um, but they said, you know, look, if you look at the time series of this type of measure, average of cost bonds, of course, liquidity deteriorated in the crisis, but then it recovered. And so there's been this kind of disconnect between what practitioners are reporting and what looks like uh, the data is saying for the past few years. And of course, you know, that's Amahood is just one measure of, of uh, liquidity. There are many, many measures of liquidity out there. Um, um, and a, a very, very large literature on this topic. Um, so, you know, what do we think we're bringing to um, the table? I'd say like our main pitch here is that um, most of these existing measures are about what we'll call realized liquidity, the liquidity of trades that actually took place. So someone chose to transact, how much did that move markets? Um, that's kind of the, the conception of liquidity uh, in, in most of the existing literature. And if you take these existing measures, there's kind of a mixed, there are mixed messages about what has happened post-crisis. You know, I showed you this picture of Amahood that suggests that uh, post-crisis liquidity is pretty good. Um, some other work has has found that for you know specific stress events, for instance, maybe liquidity has deteriorated a little bit. Um, but what we're going to try to do is move from realized liquidity uh, to, as the title of the paper suggests, perceived liquidity. So there can be a, a, a disconnect between how bond managers actually think about liquidity and what we're seeing in markets. And so there's, you know, just to throw out two reasons for that. One reason might be that um, bond managers are sort of worried about liquidity risk. It's not the case that they're worried about, you know, how liquid is the market today. They're just worried about, you know, in fact, something like, like happened in March, that there could be a sudden deterioration in liquidity. And that kind of happens in time with, uh, uh, a time when they're facing redemption requests or something like that. So one reason that um, kind of existing measures might not capture what managers are thinking is because managers are, have a kind of forward looking notion of liquidity risk. The other uh, reason that existing measures might not capture what managers are really thinking about or perceiving is that we, you know, trading is a choice. And so, um, what we're going to observe is that the, the set of uh, trades that managers choose to make, and maybe, you know, it's the case that they're transacting really only in a subset of bonds that are pretty liquid and not trading other bonds, and but they're worried about the, the liquidity of those other bonds that they're not trading very regularly. And so that's kind of um, the kind of organizing idea of the paper is that we want um, to understand not just what's happening in markets, but how, how managers are perceiving it, thinking about liquidity. And so um, kind of the, the pitch of the paper is uh, we're going to take a revealed preference approach. Um, we're going to try to look at how open end actively managed mutual funds manage their own liquidity and try to argue that that's informative about how they perceive the illiquidity of the corporate bonds they hold. Okay? And so the kind of key mechanical thing uh, we're going to do is we're going to measure perceived liquidity in the cross section of mutual funds as the relationship between how much cash those mutual funds told, uh, choose to hold and uh, the volatility of their fund flows. And so the idea here is that, you know, cash buffers allow uh, funds to meet redemption requests uh, from their clients without trading immediately. And so they can instead kind of spread their trades out over time in a way that minimizes price impact. That kind of buffer is going to be particularly valuable uh, if you're a fund that holds really relatively illiquid assets. It's also going to be particularly valuable if you're a fund that faces a lot of uncertainty about when you're going to get redemption requests. Okay? And so um, looking at cash buffers is a way to capture managers forward looking perceptions about what the liquidity of their holdings will be, you know, next month when they face redemptions um, and um, and uh, how uncertain they are about those redemptions. Okay, so that's kind of 
uh, the overall idea here is we're going to use cache buffers as, as a way to get insight into what managers are thinking about the liquidity of their, their holdings. Um, the overall agenda for the rest of the talk, and I'll, I'll stop after this slide and take some questions if there are any. Um, the overall agenda is uh, I'm going to first do, you know, it, I'm reluctant to even call it a model. It's like three lines of algebra that kind of just formalize a little bit this intuition of why looking at cash buffers might help help you think about liquidity. Um, two, uh, somewhat more serious than, uh, than the model is we're gonna have a couple of simulations that kind of show you uh, that, you know, under more realistic settings than we can solve in a model, uh, this approach kind of seems to work. Um, and then I'm gonna go to the data and I'm gonna use this approach of looking at the relationship between cash holdings and flow volatility. Uh, first in the cross section, I'm gonna show you that this suggests that uh, kind of as intuition would, would suggest and previous work has suggested that um, high yield bonds and unrated bonds are perceived by bond managers uh, to be less liquid than investment grade bonds. Uh, rule 144A bonds, um, which you know only qualified institutional buyers can hold are also perceived to be less liquid. Uh, the second thing I'll show you is that perceived illiquidity is priced. And then I'll kind of close with three different exercises that we think uh, sort of demonstrate the, the advantages of our approach. So first, um, because there's a you know tiny, tiny bit of theory in the background, we think uh, we can use our approach to kind of consistently compare liquidity across asset classes uh, in a way that might be difficult otherwise with other measures. Um, two, I'm gonna show you that um, our approach is pretty valuable in settings where there's not a lot of trade. And so we're gonna use uh, municipal bonds to demonstrate that. So a lot of municipal bonds don't trade very regularly. Um, and I'll show you that uh, one, we can apply our, our um, our methodology there, and two, um, interestingly, you know, our methodology suggests that the average muni bond is really pretty illiquid, but if you look specifically at muni bonds that don't trade very often, those bonds are less liquid, but not much less liquid than the average muni bond. And then um, the third thing I'll do is I'll return to kind of this, the time series of perceived liquidity, which was sort of the, the way I motivated this. Uh, and I'll show you that uh, in our measure, perceived liquidity does not actually recover post-crisis. Um, um, and that's in particular driven by high yield and rule 144A bonds. So let me stop there and I can take some questions if there are any. Oh yes, we do have quite a few questions already. So let me start from the very beginning. So looking at unconditional average trading costs fails the Lucas critique. In light of post-2008 high inventory costs, many dealers became just brokers that didn't hold inventories. If you look at trading costs for bonds for which dealers actually held inventories, so-called principal trades, liquidity costs are actually a lot higher. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I, I agree with that in some sense that, um, you know, let me just rephrase slightly, that if you just use trace, if you did the naive thing and use trace and just kind of looked at liquidity costs that you're observing uh, in that data, uh, you would be missing a lot of what's going on. And so that's, again, you know, one reason we think it's valuable to try to take this revealed preference approach is that presumably a mutual fund manager who's thinking about their inventory and their need, that their sort of their portfolio and their need to, to potentially trade that portfolio is internalizing all of these different, uh, these changes in market structure that has happened over time. Okay. Could you clarify how managers perceived liquidity is related to their funding liquidity? It's a great question. So in um, the basic way we're thinking about it um, is, uh, you know, in the context of a mutual fund, your funding liquidity is pretty related to your flow volatility in the sense that, um, you know, what is funding liquidity? It's like it's a little bit, the, the uncertainty I have about whether I will be able to fund um, tomorrow and at what terms I'll be able to fund. And so, you know, in a mutual fund, the first order thing that is kind of related conceptually is 
uh, are my clients going to withdraw tomorrow? So that would be, you know, like for a mutual fund, a redemption is a lot like if you're thinking about a levered intermediary, like a hedge fund, it's a lot like uh, my, my haircuts are increasing. My, uh, and so what we're effectively doing here, one way to think about what we're doing here, I think, is that we're using, we're basically saying we have a good understanding of funding liquidity for the mutual funds perspective, which would be flow volatility. And we're using that to shed light on uh, market liquidity. Okay, uh, BDESC spread is not a measure of realized liquidity, at least in the sense that it does not depend on the realized transactions. Why not rely on this measure? Lack of data? So one, yeah, one, um, at least for uh, the data I have access to, as far as I know, I, you can't kind of get the universe of bid-ask spreads. I think, you know, the other thing, again, um, bid-ask spreads have this issue that, you know, what's posted doesn't necessarily tell you uh, exactly things like what is the market depth at that bid um, or that ask. Um, and in some level, you know, I, I guess what we think is that um, the kind of relevant notion of liquidity is that is liquidity that a fund manager or a bond trader might think they need to consume. And so again, that kind of pushes us towards this um, perceived liquidity approach or this revealed preference approach where we think that that's really capturing, you know, if you looked at bid-ask spreads and you said, well, they didn't move, but of course, you know, the, the, the depth of the market has decreased, presumably fund managers would still react to that even though bid-ask spreads have not moved. Okay, since your focus is on measuring asset managers' perception, do you worry about whether their perception is based on reality? Could you check that their perception is ex exposed correct? It's a fantastic question. Um, we would love to, um, you know, as we'll talk about at, at this last exercise we do about um, about the time series and saying that kind of perceived uh, liquidity didn't recover post crisis, uh, post two thousand nine. Um, you know, in some sense, I think um, we will one day be able to do this, and one day relatively soon. Um, ask whether you know kind of the market meltdown that happened in 2000 in in march lines up with kind of what our measures were saying before then um prior to march i i think you know to the extent we had looked at it we didn't find particularly strong evidence um that perceptions and reality lined up but i think again like one reason for that could be that you know fund managers were worried about liquidity risk and we just hadn't seen the risk realized yet um but i'm it's possible and i'm hopeful that um in fact um now that we have like a real stress event in our data um you you know the asking whether perceptions and reality line up um kind of is is more feasible Okay, why won't market yields on similar security signal revealed preferences more accurately? Um, it's so I, I think that's a, it's a good question. It's a tough question in the sense that you know, um, or it's it's a well phrased question in the sense that uh, it relies on um, the word uh, similar pretty strongly. Um, and you know, like I think, if you if you're looking at market prices, you always have the issue that we're not quite sure whether uh, differences in yields or differences in kind of liquidity premium or def differences in kind of default risk or or um, you know, kind of traditional risk-based factors. Okay, and the last question, this point: Does cash buffer confound risk with liquidity of the underlying portfolio? Good. So I will show you some evidence that I think that um, um, that's not going to be the case for mutual funds. I, I, you know, I, I think if you if you look at something like, you know, a set of 
kind of very discretionary hedge funds, you would be worried about this point because you know there are some there are some funds where their strategy, you know, if you're a distressed debt hedge fund, your strategy is that you're going to have you know forty or fifty percent of your assets in cash until some uh, really attractive things come along, and in that case, it's it's not that your cash buffer is really reflecting the liquidity of your portfolio assets; it's reflecting um, other factors like your strategy or you know your kind of view on uh, the risk return trade. You know, if you're a market timer, you will also kind of have your cash buffer moving around over time. Um, so we think that one looking at mutual funds where there's a relatively um, tight constraint on, on managers um, is helpful too. And I'll get to this in the model just now. Um, this is the reason we kind of want to look at the cross-sectional relationship between cash buffers uh, and fund flow volatility as opposed to just the level of cash buffers because we think that that relationship, um, there's kind of fewer confounds um, between uh, fewer other drivers of that relationship as opposed to the level of cash where many things drive it. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, um, I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. All right, thank you. Great. So, um, okay, so here we go. A very simple, as I said, don't even, don't even really call it a model. Um, but just to kind of get the, the intuition of, of what we're trying to do uh, formalized, um, so let's just think of a fund um, and, you know, it has one dollar of assets under management um, and that one dollar of assets can be associated with random withdrawals of X. Um, next period, I'm going to assume that X is normally distributed. Of course, this doesn't make any sense because, you know, um, this is saying that a dollar of assets under management can be associated with more than one dollar of outflows, but just, just to get things in a nice closed form, um, we're going to assume that things are normally distributed. That's not actually important in any way. Um, so what does the fund do? It chooses between invest, investing in an illiquid asset and cash. Um, if it invests in the illiquid asset and has to sell that asset, it faces liquid, liquidation cost C for selling the asset. Um, if it holds cash, um, the cash comes with a carrying cost, I. You can think of that carrying cost as sort of the cost of tracking error for the fund. And so this is, again, a reason that we think mutual funds are a good setting for this because, you know, they um, are benchmarked uh, and, and mutual fund clients care a lot about tracking error. And so um, from the fund's perspective, you know, um, holding cash is costly because it induces tracking error. Yep. And so um, we're going to have a kind of very simple mechanical model where you just assume that uh, the fund is going to meet outflows. If it has outflows, it's going to meet those outflows by liquidating its reserves first. Um, and so what is the fund going to do? The fund's problem is that it just wants to, uh, to minimize its overall costs of liquidity management. And though there's two parts to the cost of liquidity management. One is that if it chooses reserves R, it's always gonna have to pay this carrying cost R, I. Um, so that, that is always there. Um, the other cost it's gonna have to pay is uh, stochastic and depends on exactly the realization of X, but the expected liquidation cost the fund is gonna have to pay uh, depends on R. So if I have outflows less than R, I don't pay any liquidation cost because I just use my cash buffer. Um, but if I have outflows greater than R, then I have to meet those outflows by selling assets and uh, selling those assets has cost C. Okay. So uh, that's what the fund is doing. It's just trying to minimize um, its overall costs of liquidity management. And so if you, um, just, you know, this extremely simple model that we set up. The optimal uh, cash to assets ratio in this model uh, is going to be R star, which is, uh, this is the inverse of the normal uh, CDF of one minus um, 
the carry cost divided by the liquidation cost uh, times uh, sigma, which is the volatility of, of fund flows. Okay, and so one, one thing to note here is because of this way we set up the model, uh, you need to assume that the carrying costs are not too high. So if the carrying costs are higher than uh, the liquidation cost of the illiquid asset divided by two, then I will hold zero cash because I would prefer, like holding cash is too costly, I would prefer to just uh, have to sell the illiquid asset when that happens. But if the carrying costs are relatively low, then um, cash holdings take this form. And um, you can show some simple things about um, about the relationship, about comparative statics that drive uh, the cash assets ratio. Okay, so one, um, the cash assets ratio is gonna increase with the volatility of flows. So I, if my flows, if I'm more uncertain about uh, the redemptions I'll face tomorrow, I hold more cash. Uh, two, if I'm, if the non-cash asset I'm holding uh, is more illiquid in the sense that it's costlier to sell, uh, I will hold more cash. And then three, the kind of critical uh, comparative static that we're gonna use is that this, there's the, the cross partials, the interaction term uh, is also positive. So if I hold a more illiquid asset, then as you increase the uncertainty I face about redemptions, my cash holdings rise faster. Okay. And so um, what we're gonna do is effectively use this slope dr d sigma uh, to understand illiquidity. Okay? And so the idea is that uh, if your assets, intuitively the idea is that if your assets are super liquid, then you don't really care about how much uncertainty you face, uh, flow, uh, flow uncertainty you face, because you know no matter what happens, you'll just sell your assets to meet, meet redemptions. As your assets get more and more illiquid, you care more and more about that flow volatility. And so uh, the slope of the relationship between, um, between um, cash and, and flows, uh, uh, flow uncertainty uh, is gonna tell us something about illiquidity. So that's kind of the very simple uh, basic model. Why don't I stop there again and take some questions. Okay, so how is this measure going to capture the liquidity right after the realization of stressed events? Say managers expect a shortfall of liquidity and do hold more cash, but after the event happens, they exhaust their cash. Great. Um, so I will, this is one of the simulations I'm going to do, is I'm just going to show you that, of course, this is a static model where there's just one choice. Um, what I'll show you is that in a dynamic model, um, we're just gonna simulate a dynamic model that exists in the data and show you that in that dynamic model, um, the same kind of intuition applies. And the reason for that is that, you know, in a dynamic model, even the, you're right that after um, I've had outflows, my cash is gonna look pretty low, but on average, um, my cash is gonna be pretty high. And so that's what the regression is gonna pick up is that average effect as opposed to the, the particular timed event that after an outflow, I've got, it's gonna look like I have low cash. Okay, so how different do you think is the perceived liquidity in the minds of mutual fund managers and that of bond dealers? It's a good question. Um, I would, um, I, it's, it's not a question that I have a, a data informed view about um, because we, we don't have that much uh, much evidence on what the dealers themselves think aside from surveys. And so I'd say like where we're going, the results I'll show you at the end that suggest that, um, you know, that liquidity has deteriorated, perceived liquidity is pretty low in the corporate bond market after 2009. That is consistent with what dealers say. Um, but it would be interesting to kind of do more on that and figure out um, if it kind of is quantitatively similar to dealer perceptions. Okay, I'm not sure whether it's a question or a comment. Uh, actually, Sigma should depend on the liquidity of the portfolio. There are strategic complementarities, the Siegelstein et al, that cause investors to run on the fund more quickly in the case of more liquid portfolios. Uh, that's, I think that's totally right. Um, you know, 
we'll talk about this a little bit. So going from this simple intuition uh, to um, an empirical measure, one thing we're going to do is uh, we're not going to just run this in the cross section of funds. Uh, we're going to actually blow up the panel to the security level um, with the goal of comparing two funds that hold the same security uh, but have different flow volatility. But I think you're right that a, a general question here is that we're, um, um, you're going to worry a little bit about uh, the relation, w why funds have different, face different flow volatilities. Okay, do we have to worry about reverse causality that fund volatility is endogenously determined by fund illiquidity? Yep. Um, so same kind of answer. We're going to try, try to address this in part by um, comparing two funds that hold the same security. But um, let's come back to, to that um, in a few slides. Okay, and probably last uh, question at this point. In your model, the carrying cost of cash will vary based on the opportunity of investments. What are the comparative statics for this cost and do you include this in your empirical tests? Yeah, so I think um, when I get to this, uh, to these empirical stuff where I'm gonna try to do uh, cross asset class comparisons, this will become more clear, but I might as well just say it now. So I think the important thing is that um, tracking error needs to be treated proportionally. And if that's true, then um, exactly what I write down is fine. So what I mean by that is, so think about a bond manager versus an equity manager, um, both of whom want to hold, you know, 1% uh, of their portfolio in cash. And so of course, if you think like, bonds on average return 3% and equities on average return 10%, then you know the numerical, the raw kind of return drag um, from the cash holdings is only 30 basis points for uh, the bond fund, uh, but one percentage point for, um, for the equity fund. So long as you think that, um, clients care about tracking error kind of proportional to the overall expected return of um, the fund or the asset class, then we're going to be able to make these comparisons. And so that I think is actually kind of plausible is that, you know, you're pe penalized as a manager um, in kind of relative terms as opposed to absolute terms. Um, but that is, that is an assumption. All right. Thank you. Okay, great. So, um, so from the model to what we actually do, there's kind of three, uh, three steps that are important. Um, and I'll just go through them in detail. So the first one is thinking about the level of cash versus the relationship between cash and flow volatility, which we talked about a little bit. The second is whether you can come up with a, whether you want a bond or market level measure of liquidity. And then the third is, uh, which I also just mentioned is thinking about doing fund level versus position level regressions. So um, first point, as I've mentioned before, um, you know, in the model, both the level of cash and the relationship between cash and flow volatility rise with illiquidity. Um, in practice, cash holdings are seem to be mainly determined, uh, uh, the level of cash holdings uh, has other determinants beyond liquidity management considerations. So the one I mentioned before is that, you know, some funds may just be following a, a dry powder strategy, uh, a market timing strategy. Um, other kind of more sort of mundane uh, factors include things like, you know, if you are short selling or using derivatives or, or taking leverage, um, you're gonna have to hold cash in a margin account. Uh, and so that's just going to distort the level of cash holdings um, for reasons that are not directly uh, about uh, liquidity management in all cases. Uh, so what we're going to do uh, is look at the cross-sectional relationship between flow volatility and cash, um, hoping that that's a little bit less contaminated by these factors. Um, second uh, kind of issue going from the very simple model to actual data, um, is you know at what level 
of granularity can you actually use this, this idea? Um, so if you just think about, suppose that uh, funds set their cash assets ratios according to this equation. So the cash assets ratio of the fund is just a weighted average of how illiquid the bonds in the fund are, uh, where these Ws are the portfolio weights, um, times the bonds, bonds flow volatility. So if I wanted to estimate a bond by bond um, measure of illiquidity, I couldn't actually do that because this is a system of, you know, F funds cross T time periods equations, but I'll have B bonds times T time periods uh, unknowns. And so I just don't actually have enough funds in the data to estimate liquidity bond by one bond. Um, so there's kind of two approaches you could take. One is to assume that bonds have constant liquidity over time. That in our data, you might barely be able to do that. Um, the number of uh, funds and the and the number of bonds is, 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 is uh, you might be able to do that. The approach we're actually going to take, again, because we are interested in this time variation and in understanding uh, whether, um, whether uh, liquidity has deteriorated over time or not, or is perceived to have deteriorated over time, um, is that we're going to not estimate a bond level measure of liquidity. We're going to estimate a kind of market level um, measure of liquidity. And so in particular, we're going to assign bonds into different categories like investment grade versus high yield or, you know, rating by rating and um, assume that all bonds within the category um, have the same liquidity. And, and so that's, that is a drawback of our approach is that um, you can't get a bond level measure. Um, but I think that assumption allows you um, that simplification allows you to do some things that um, are new and interesting. Okay. Um, third, third piece, which I again also mentioned, um, is that um, there's two ways, um, two ways to structure the data. One is at the fund level, I could be running regressions of uh, fund level cash on you know what share of your portfolio is in investment grade bonds times your um, times your flow volatility, what share of your portfolio is in secured bonds times um, your flow volatility, and then I could look at these beta coefficients. As uh, people have brought up already, you know one important thing here is that of course um, flows and holdings are co-determined. Uh, and so you might worry, for instance, that a fund with, a, with volatile flows will choose to hold more liquid securities. Uh, conversely, you might uh, worry that, you know, clients looking at the fund will, if the fund is holding very illiquid things, then your flows will be more volatile. And so um, to, I don't think this solves it perfectly. Um, but one thing we're going to do to try to address this uh, uh, this kind of endogenous relationship between flows and, and holdings um, is that we're going to blow up the panel. Okay, so we're going to have a bond fund time panel where, again, of course, cash only varies at the fund level, but I can blow up the panel to the bond level. I can then put in bond time fixed effects. So I'm only comparing, um, you know, two funds we hold the same security. Um, one has higher flow volatility than the other. How does that affect my cash holdings? Right? And so of course we're gonna have to cluster correctly because we're kind of replicating the data a bunch of times here. But um, the main uh, kind of benefit of this approach is that we can put in these security time fixed effects and kind of get a sense of how important uh, this endogeneity issue is. Okay. So um, let, me, let me stop there. And, and take some more questions. All right, so we have one question in the queue at the moment. Probably there are going to be a few more by the time we finish answering this question. So are you looking at mutual funds that invest in either muni bonds or cash only, or possibly hybrid funds where the definition of cash could include other liquid instruments such as USTs or foreign sovereigns or even highly liquid stocks? Um, it's a great question. So we're, we're, um, we're going to, 
include um, treasuries uh, ho and holdings of, say, money market mutual funds in our in our definition of cash. Um, we're just going to actually control for uh, the fraction of the portfolio that's invested in, so you know, stocks or ETFs. Thinking of that as a somewhat alternative um, alternative use of um, of, of uh, an alternative source of liquidity. Um, the one other thing I'll say on this, which uh, you mentioned, is that in our data, uh, which is Morningstar Holdings data, we can't really differentiate between long-term and short-term treasuries, and so we're just going to uh, use data from from uh, FISD uh, and count. Uh, treasuries and agency securities with less than one year maturity as, as cash. Um, the other issue this raises is that we're going to only be looking at kind of um, long-term corporate bond funds. Uh, we're not going to look at short-term, short, you know, ultra short duration funds because for those it's extremely hard to tell the difference between uh, cash and non-cash assets. I guess you come into this point in your data part but is there much flow variation of our funds investing in similar bonds? If so, what determines that? It's a good question. You know, I mean, I think um, one, yes, I'll show you that there is significant variation. And two, um, you know, I think there's probably, um, we don't, my reading of this is we don't have great models of what explains flows and flow volatilities. You know, we, we know things like, uh, the age of the fund matters. There is some sense that people are learning about the manager. Uh, and so at the beginning, we have more volatile flows than we have afterwards. Um, but, you know, I, my view on this is we actually, you know, if you looked at things like even like um, the literature on the performance flow relationship and things like R squares are not super high. Um, there's a lot of flows that we, um, don't understand and you know um, we we are aside from the fact that you know I think that this including security time fixed effects helps uh, a bit um, we are relying on those that flow volatility not being strongly strongly endogenous. that's that's just an assumption all right. Yep. Thank you. Let's move on. Great. So, um, okay. So, one other thing I'll say is that you know we've used this very simple model to motivate um, motivate our approach, but at some level, I don't think we we don't think you know we're not assuming we don't need the model to hold exactly in the data. Uh, for the general intuitions to make sense. And the general intuitions are that like larger cash buffers are more valuable when assets are liquid uh, or are illiquid and when liquidity demands, when client demands are unpredictable. And I think that those general intuitions are probably uh, valid under many assumptions beyond the specific assumptions we made. So just to explore the robustness of the idea a little bit, uh, in the paper, we do two types of simulations. Um, the first one is just a static simulation that aims to understand, you know, I, my model has one bond. How does the has how does that model intuition translate when you have a portfolio of bonds? And then the second, which I mentioned before, is uh, we're going to do a dynamic simulation to understand how these intuitions apply when you know there's not just one cash decision uh, and one flow, but you're, you know, you're a fund that's managing over time, uh, and you have uh, many flows and and many, and you're con constantly kind of adjusting your your cash buffer over time. And so, first, the static stimulation. All we do here is we assume that, um, you know, there are we simulate bonds. We assume that they have different uh, liquidities or sort of different transaction costs of of um, of trading the bond, and then we assume that funds, uh, you know, select different bonds, um, and then we apply our model. We say like the cash that the bond, the fund chose, chooses to hold, um, is based on the average liquidity of bonds in their portfolio. 
Okay. And so uh, what's the point of doing the simulation? Um, the point is that it, it, it shows you something um, that uh, is important as an assumption, which is that, uh, you know, of course, this, this approach is not going to work if uh, bonds differ in their liquidity, but fund portfolios don't differ in their average liquidity. So if all funds are kind of at random picking um, a large set of bonds and end up with the same average um, li portfolio liquidity, you're not going to get any variation in, in, our, in cash holdings. So um, here in our simulation, what you see is that, you know, if this is the distribution of liquidity, um, uh, of actual liquidity in, in different funds, and this these are the estimated coefficients. And so, what you need um, is that you need there to be variation in liquidity in across portfolios that is large relative to the variation in liquidity within portfolios. And so, we actually again think that here, you know, mutual funds are useful uh, because charters constrain the portfolios uh, in kind of important ways. Uh, and so, that's going to make this assumption a little bit more palatable. Um, the dynamic simulation, um, we're just going to uh, going to take a paper by um, Connor and Leland in 1995. Um, they solve, they think about the problem of a fund that um, like our static model, um, there's a fund, it has cash, which, which has a costly, which is costly to carry, and there's an illiquid asset that's costly to trade. Um, and then they think about the dynamic problem of that fund trying to minimize its liquidity costs over time as it faces stochastic flows. Um, you know, this is a more complicated model than I myself could solve, but we're going to just kind of lift it off the shelf and say that, you know, what they show is that that fund um, should follow an SS type rule. So it should, if it has inflows, it should build them up in cash until it gets to some level. Um, once, once it exceeds that level, it should invest that cash in uh, the illiquid assets. And then if it has outflows, it should draw cash down uh, until it gets to zero. And when it hits zero, it should kind of re replenish its cash buffer uh, by selling the illiquid assets. So they have solved the dynamic problem under certain assumptions, what we do is we just simulate. And so we say, you know, let's simulate flows um, for fund, for a Connor and Leland style fund. Let's look at its actual realized uh, cash position period by period. Uh, and then let's run our regression in that data. So we're gonna run uh, a regression of, you know, the funds cash at time T on in sample estimated flow volatility. Um, and this shows you that even in a dynamic setting, you kind of get um, get the same intuition that you got from our simple model, which is that uh, the less liquid, uh, um, the, the less liquid the assets the fund holds, the larger the regression coefficient when we run this in simulated data regression of fund cash on estimated fund flow volatility. Um, um, the one other thing I'll mention across these two simulations that um, was not obvious to us that was going to be true, but appears to be true um, approximately in these simulations is that there seems to be a approximately linear relationship uh, between how this regression coefficient uh, increases as you increase illiquidity of the underlying asset. And so I am going to refer to, you know, a doubling of the regression coefficient as a doubling of illiquidity. Um, that again is, um, it's kind of an assumption, but it's assumption that's borne out uh, in these simulations at least. Um, and I guess before I get to the actual uh, data, if there are any other uh, questions. Well, I don't I can... see any questions in the queue. I guess they've been typed right as I'm <laughs> speaking. So, but uh, let's just move on a little bit with the results. By the way, we are about into the last 20 minutes of our presentation. Just okay, to, so uh, yeah, I'll, about this. yeah I'll, I'll pick up the pace a little bit. So let me, uh, the data is, 
holding bond holding data from Morningstar. Um, we're going to focus on 2009 to 2016 because we have daily fund flows for that period and that makes it easier for us to estimate uh, fund flow volatility. Uh, we're going to look at taxable funds where at least 50% of the portfolio is bonds. Um, this is the definition of cash holdings. Um, and you know we make some corrections um, to the Morningstar beta data based on um, um, other, other data. Okay, and so flow volatility, uh, as I said, we're gonna try to measure it daily over the last three months. Um, when we go back to the pre-2009 period, we don't have daily flows, and so there we're gonna estimate flow volatility monthly. Okay. So um, this is just some summary stats. Uh, I'm gonna push on in the interest of time. So first thing we're gonna do is this is just a basic, basic regression that, regress, uh, that relates um, fund cash holdings to fund flow volatility. So the, the, the critical coefficients throughout the, the rest of the talk are gonna be the coefficients on uh, sigma FT, which, are the, which is flow volatility. And this shows you that the, the basic, um, basic relationship that we were hoping for in the data is there. If I'm a fund and I face higher flow volatility, I do hold more cash. Um, the, the economic magnitude we think is meaningful. So if my flow volatility is one standard deviation higher, uh, my cash assets ratio is almost 50 basis points higher and the average cash assets ratio is like 3.2%. So it's meaningful. Um, one thing to just point out is going from column one to column two here, uh, sorry, go going across all the columns here, uh, we're adding various fixed effects. And so in column four, we have both fixed effects for um, fund objective cross date. Uh, and so this is like, we're only comparing, you know, high yield bond funds to one another um, at the same date. And we also, as I said, we have these bond date fixed effects. So again, we've blown up the panel to be bond fund time and we're putting bond date fixed effects in. So we're comparing uh, two funds that hold the same bond, um, but face different flow volatilities. And again, you kind of get similar results. So, you know, adding these bond, uh, we're gonna add the bond date fixed effects throughout, but that at least suggests that on average in the data, um, kind of the endogeneity of security, the, the endogenous relationship between portfolio holdings and flow volatility is not sort of a defining feature of the data. Okay. Um, we do some stuff to just kind of look at whether dynamically um, this relationship depends a lot on things like market timing or uh, performance flow relationship. Um, we don't find that much effort, evidence of this. So I'm gonna just kind of skip this in, in the interest of time and go to, um, go to kind of uh, the more substantive results. So um, here we're gonna sort of start with the cross section. Okay? And so we're gonna ask like uh, using our methodology, uh, what is the cross section of perceived liquidity? And so the way we're gonna do this is, oops, sorry, um, we're gonna um, look at interaction terms uh, between flow volatility and bond characteristics. And so the idea is that, um, you know, if uh, a particular bond, a particular type of bond is l perceived to be less liquid, then when I hold a lot of those particular types of bonds in my portfolio, the relationship between cash holdings and flow volatility should get stronger. So again, we're always, we're looking at the, the slope of this cross-sectional relationship and how steep it is effectively tells us um, how illiquid uh, that particular type of bond is perceived to be, okay? And so what this says is that, you know, um, Investment grade bonds, which are kind of the omitted category here, um, are perceived to be somewhat illiquid. But once you look at speculative grade or unrated bonds, they're perceived to be significantly less liquid than investment grade bonds. Because again, the slope of this cross-sectional relationship between cash and flow volatility is getting much steeper um, as you look at uh, these types of bonds. Okay? So that's kind of, um, the main takeaway from this table, we find um, other bond characteristics 
do matter for perceived liquidity, but they matter um, substantially less. So uh, larger offerings, longer maturity bonds uh, are perceived to be slightly less liquid. Um, but rule 144A bonds and secured bonds are also perceived to be slightly less liquid. And then this last column just shows you um, putting all of those characteristics in together, um, you get somewhat similar results. Um, so maybe time for one question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, are you measuring perceptions of liquidity or perceptions about future fund flows? A manager may believe that a bond is highly liquid, but that the likelihood of future withdrawals is very low. Therefore, low cash holdings might be optimal, even though the manager believes the bond is illiquid. Right, so that that's a great point. Um, we have, um, and let me just translate it to, to how it relates to the model and the empirics. In the model, there's just this sigma, which is, is future uh, flow volatility. What we're using is past realized flow volatility in these regressions. And so the kind of key assumption is that um, past realized flow volatility um, is a good proxy for perceived future flow uncertainty and to your point that that's kind of constant over time and across funds. And so we've done some some work in the appendix. I, I unfortunately don't think I have that in the slides, but um, as far as we can tell, that's not a bad assumption. That, uh, in other words, if you tried to predict future flow volatility with past flow volatility, um, that relationship is pretty stable over time and in the cross section. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, so um, that was the cross section of kind of perceived volatility, then the next thing we do, which is a kind of standard thing to do in this literature, is um, ask whether perceived illiquidity is priced. It, this is a little complicated here because we don't generate a um, bond by bond measure of liquidity. Like normally what you do is you just kind of measure liquidity at the bond level and then relate um, kind of the, the realized average returns on, uh, on those bonds uh, to their illiquidity. Here, we have to do something that's a slightly more complicated since we don't, um, we're not generating a bond level measure. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're actually just gonna interact the bond's yield with flow volatility. And so what this is actually asking is, um, are higher yielding bonds um, perceived to be less liquid? Okay. And so, um, of course, there might be many reasons for that and things like, you know, bonds that are close to default risk might not, uh, default might not trade much. And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna one, restrict the sample to investment grade bonds. Uh, and two, we're gonna try to control for as many bond characteristics as possible in their interactions um, with flow volatility. And so this is asking, you know, um, do high yielding bonds, uh, are they perceived to be less liquid, controlling for the fact that other things also affect how, uh, how liquid a bond is perceived to be, including rating, uh, size, maturity, all the things that were on the previous slide when we look at, uh, looked at the cross section. And so what we find is that it is, it is the case that higher yielding bonds um, are perceived to be less liquid. This interaction term between sigma flows and uh, yield to maturity is positive and, and, and significant. And so uh, it does seem like uh, illiqu perceived illiquidity is priced in the cross section of investment grade bonds. Um, but again, this is, it, this is not a kind of perfect exercise because uh, our technology, our methodology is not, not perfectly set up uh, to do, uh, to kind of take the traditional approach uh, to determining whether liquidity is priced or not. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna kind of try to do three um, exercises that kind of show off uh, or uh, demonstrate uh, why we think this is kind of an interesting 
uh, approach and you know these these exercises will highlight the the pluses and minuses of this approach relative to uh, to to kind of traditional approaches to measuring liquidity so um, the first thing we're going to do uh, is we're going to look at uh, perceived liquidity cross asset classes you know why is this normally hard to do I think there's kind of two reasons one is that data availability is a little dicey. So, you know, you might not be able to get uh, all the necessary transaction data to look at uh, liquidity in foreign equity markets or, or, you know, muni bonds don't trade that much. And so it's a little bit hard to uh, measure their liquidity. Um, the second reason is that, you know, there's just different market microstructures. And so if you try to, you know, compare, just to take the, the silliest straw man, suppose I tried to compare uh, the trading volume of uh, domestic and foreign stocks, that, in and of, you know, even if you're trying to compare the trading volume of stocks that trade on the NYSC and the NASDAQ, as, as you all know, like the microstructure details matter there. Um, and so, um, we think our approach is useful because, uh, again, like you know, the basic calculus of how much cash a fund should hold um, doesn't necessarily depend on those microstructure details. Uh, and so, as I said, the key assumption here is that you need to be funds need to be thinking about the carrying costs of cash. Um, in these proportional terms. So the assumption here that would make this kind of comparison valid is that um, the tracking error generated by a 1% cash holding for a bond fund is equally painful as the tracking error uh, generated by holding a 1% cash holding for an equity fund. So that's the assumption. Um, we think it's plausible, but it's an assumption. Right? But if you buy the assumption, then again, I'm just rerunning these kind of regressions of uh, cash holdings on flow volatility. Um, again, blowing up the sample to kind of include uh, security time fixed effects uh, everywhere. And what this shows you is that, um, you know, you get kind of intuitive results. So foreign equities um, are less liquid than domestic equities. Um, and, you know, both of these are, I'd say, you know, in, if you compare them to bonds, both foreign equities and domestic equities are pretty liquid, but, you know, foreign equities compared to domestic equities um, are significantly less liquid. Again, if you thought about um, things being linear, this is saying that, you know, foreign equities are kind of 50% less liquid than, perceived to be 50% less liquid than U.S. domestic equities. Um, if you go to bond funds, then you see that you know corporate bonds are are perceived to be significantly less liquid uh, than domestic and foreign equities, but much more liquid than munis are perceived to be. Uh, so that's kind of one exercise that we can do that we think is pretty interesting and it gives intuitive results. The other thing I'll say that of course is is an assumption lurking in the background is that I mean these results apply to bonds held by mutual funds. Um, of course, and oh, to securities held by mutual funds. Um, so, hey, yeah. Can you have a few questions here yep. now? Mm -hmm. So how does inter-fund competition play a role here? Is there a cross-sectional variability in fund flows for similar funds? Some will need to hold high cash. Uh, so that reduces their yield. So will, will they lose out? Um, that is a good question. I would say that... Um, I would say that, so the assumption that we're operating under is that um, each fund is following the kind of long run value maximizing liquidity management strategy. And so taking, um, taking their uh, flow volatility and the kind of illiquidity of the set of assets they can play in as given um, they are holding cash that they think maximizes, um, you know, the problem I set up was a maximization problem over um, today and tomorrow. Um, 
an interesting thing that we, we might want to think about a little more is, um, you know, you might wonder whether um, competitive dynamics of the sort you're talking about lead to a little bit of risk shifting. So, you know, maybe if I'm a, if I'm a young fund, uh, for instance, I hold a little bit less cash than would be optimal for an older fund uh, just because I want to print high returns and it's particularly valuable for me to print high returns. Um, so that's, that's a, it's an interesting point um, that we should probably think about a little more. Again, you know, the main thing I'll fall, fall back on, um, which is uh, only incomplete is this idea that like, again, we're, we're always comparing funds um, that are holding the same security. And so, um, you know, if you thought that competitive dynamics were super strong in speculative grade funds, but not investment grade funds, that's not gonna be a concern here. Okay, a kind of related question. Do you find cross-sectional differences based on the size of the fund family? Bond mutual funds make cross-trade liquid bonds. Yes, and so we have some, um, we often control, I mean, as you can see here, we control for things like, uh, the fund size and the fund family size in, in order to get at uh, things like, you know, there's some, there's some economies of scale and liquidity management, you know, at the family level, part of that comes through cross trading. Um, we have done some, um, we've also done some robustness um, of the form of, uh, you know, only looking at funds that are either in you know small families or families without credit lines or families that don't have interfund trading programs and we generally find pretty similar results I, I think you know the takeaway from that is um, not that these other alternative liquidity management strategies don't matter um, it's just that they're somewhat orthogonal to the use of cash as a liquidity management strategy Okay, uh, you swept fund in and inflows and outflows into funding liquidity when these are just reallocations of capital to other managers and instruments. However, industry news have recently focused on issues in the repo markets. So how do we think about what is usually classified as funding liquidity, terms and availability for bond repos and money close to, uh, to the fund, since those are missing from this model? Um, they're missing from the model. I'd also say that, again, you know, there are pros and cons of using mutual fund data. I, my impression, which I'm happy to be told is wrong, but my impression is that, um, you know, mutual funds, you know, the average mutual fund is unlevered uh, and therefore is not using a ton of repo financing, for instance, um, to the extent that, um, repo financing shows up and conditions in the repo market show up, in our measure, I would expect it to be somewhat indirect. So if you think about like, you know, of course, liquidity is an equilibrium object, uh, even though I have not really treated it like one. Uh, it, it, like what a mutual fund manager is thinking about when they're thinking about liquidity is, well, what, what kind of price impact am I gonna have when I need to sell my bond to someone else? that someone else may well be a hedge fund or a dealer that is using repo financing. And so when that side of the market deteriorates, you know, if, depending on how sophisticated mutual fund uh, perceptions are, um, fund managers themselves may react, but it, it's, it's gonna be indirect. Um, okay, last question for now, and then all the remaining questions will be taken at the end of the presentation. So is it your view that all funds are liquidity takers? Some funds might see illiquidity as an opportunity, not a cost. They might use cash to buy into fire sales and earn a premium. In that case, the coefficient of interest should be flipped. Therefore, you should get stronger results if you can isolate funds that typically demand liquidity. Yeah, so I think, um we might, one way to say this is that we might actually be conditioning on funds that are liquidity takers uh, just by the way we're just constructing the data set. So, you know, as, as I, I went quickly, but I said that, you know, we're only looking at funds, funds in our data have to have at least 50% of their portfolio assets in, uh, in bonds. And so if you're a fund that is, you know, normally following the dry powder strategy and, and or a, as a liquidity supplier, um, 
you're going to have a lot more dry powder. And so, uh, one, um, my basic view is that um, dry powder strategies are typically, you know, they're much more likely to be followed by hedge funds than mutual funds. Uh, but two, to the extent they are followed by mutual funds, they might not be in our, our data um, to start with. I think you're, you're, it's an interesting point, and you're right that, I mean, at some level, we could think of doing uh, kind of a more granular version of this and like kind of conditioning on, uh, you know, broad characteristics of your portfolio composition. So like, are you a fund that normally has tons of cash versus are you a fund that has very little cash? Um, redoing the the analysis, separating out those different kinds of funds. And it would be could, kind of cool if we found what you suggest, which is that um, things should flip for certain types of funds. All right, thank you. Great. So last two exercises I'll go through quickly since we're a little short on time. Um, the first is that we can, we can estimate perceived liquidity for muni bonds. Um, the average, you know, 70% of munis don't trade in a given month. Um, and uh, so uh, it's kind of a nice feature of our methodology that even though there's not a ton of transaction data, we can still estimate uh, liquidity. And so what we find, as I said on the previous slide, um, is that one, munis are much less liquid, perceived to be much less liquid than corporate bonds. Two, another kind of interesting uh, fact is that if you compare the set of munis that don't trade at all in a given month or trade, you know, less than $100,000 of face value in a given month versus all munis, um, we find that they're perceived to be less liquid, but not much less liquid. So it's basically like the average muni held by mutual funds is perceived to be quite illiquid, but whether those munis trade or not is not like a strong cross-sectional determinant of how, how, um, how liquid they're perceived to be. And then um, the last thing we do, uh, which comes back to my motivation at the beginning of the talk, uh, is to think about the time series of perceived liquidity. So here we're gonna, again, we're gonna run these regressions of cash holdings on sigma flows, but with interaction terms for the pre-crisis period, the crisis period, and the post-crisis period. Um, once you're doing time series comparisons, you know, the model implies that you need to actually control for carrying costs as they change over time. And so we're gonna do that uh, by interacting sigma flows with a measure of the liquidity premium from um, some of Stefan Nagel's work. Um, and so what that suggests when we do this is that if you look at column two here, um, you can see that the coefficient rises in the crisis period and then comes back uh, post-crisis, but not all the way. And so that suggests that, you know, in the corporate bond market, liquidity deteriorated, but then it recovered. If you, for comparison, do this with domestic socks, you see that equity liquidity is perceived to have de declined in the crisis, but then it actually fully came back. Okay, and so that's kind of the critical distinction uh, we're interested in is that um, kind of like practitioners have been saying, um, by this measure, which is, you know, it's kind of a put their money where your mouth is measure, uh, managers are behaving as though they think uh, liquidity in the post-crisis period is worse than the pre-crisis period. Um, that's particularly true for speculative grade bonds. We don't find much for investment grade bonds. Um, it's also particularly true uh, for rule 144A bonds. And then the last thing I'll close with is that, um, you know, as my motivation slide suggested, this is actually, it's about our measure. If you try to look at um, the time series of the Amahood measure, um, which is a measure of realized liquidity for actual trades that happened, uh, both in the corporate bond market and in uh, the stock market, uh, the Amahood measure suggests that uh, realized liquidity for trades that happened um, in corporate bonds and domestic stocks post-crisis is as good as it was pre-crisis. Uh, and so this kind of emphasizes this distinction between perceived and realized liquidity. And I think it also shows that our, our results are not just driven by composition. You know, if you thought that um, what's happened is that there's way more high yield bonds than there used to be pre-crisis, um, that would also show up uh, in this Amahood 
um, calculation that we're doing. Okay. So um, that's all I have for today, um, I'm, though I'm happy to take questions at, at the end. Um, you know, so we're going to propose a new measure of how to uh, use revealed preference arguments to understand what mutual fund managers perceive uh, the liquidity of their securities that they hold to be. Um, we think it's nice because it, for instance, allows you to estimate uh, illiquidity when you don't have much transaction data um, or when you're worried that certain securities are transacting much less than others. Um, the costs of doing this are that we're, um, you have to kind of do this at the category or market level rather than estimating uh, liquidity for individual bonds and that we're, we, you know, because our holdings data is mutual fund holdings, um, you have to condition this on bonds that are held by mutual funds. Um, so thanks a lot for your, for your comments and I'll, I'll take some more questions if there's time or, um, we yeah, kind of thanks. slightly over time, but let's okay. maybe take one or two more questions. So how do you think about the symmetry of in and out flows? Do you, uh, high realized cash flows volatility could be caught by past superior interior, uh, inferior performance and then just shall predict large outflows if the past returns are worse than the benchmark. Yeah, we, I, I skipped over this in the interest of time. We have, we've done some simple stuff where we, for instance, just uh, run our baseline regression, but we include past and future flows and past and future returns as controls. And so that would help you uh, with these kind of market timing considerations or, you know, managers knowing uh, that flows are coming and you find pretty similar results. So again, I think, um, you know, these things do happen in the data. Uh, they're just kind of not uh, on average what's driving cash holdings. All right, I think we are well you know, over time by now. And uh, if there's any remaining questions, please uh, you know, either type them into the uh, chat and we will give them to Adi uh, after the seminar is over. Uh, for now, let me just thank Adi for this wonderful presentation and uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. And I hope you also join us next week as well. So uh, thank you very much for being with us and see you next time. Thanks very much for having me. This is great.